Let's, uh, let's start into the Word of God. 1 Samuel chapter 14 says this. It says, Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. Um, Interesting verse when you look at this. King Saul, when he was ordained as king, first king over Israel, he had a number of specific assignments that God had wanted him to accomplish. Number one, he was to unite the tribes of Israel into one cohesive nation. For the first time, they were going to be a cohesive nation. Saul was to accomplish that. He didn't get that done. Secondly, he was supposed to drive out the inhabitants of the promised land that actually began with the occupation under Joshua. You remember, Joshua entered the land. They began to drive out the inhabitants of the land. That didn't get done. King Saul was supposed to also finish that. He didn't get that done. Thirdly, he was supposed to live an exemplary life that was to bring glory to God. He didn't do that either. He didn't do any of these. As a matter of fact, at this time, when we look at this scripture, uh, King King Saul is in his early years of kingship, and the Philistines are uh, living on the western border of Israel. And the battle lines have kind of been drawn up. The two armies kind of meet in this place called Michmash. I just love that name. That's just fun to say. I wish I lived in Michmash. I like, where are you from? Michmash. It's like totally awesome. Uh, Michmash, I was taking a bath. I mean, just, you know, it's a really cool, it's just fun to say. And so they're, here they are, they, they, they draw up in Michmash. And, and here's what's happening is that King Saul is playing not to lose. And when you play not to lose, guess what? Chances are you're not going to win either. If you take that defensive kind of, I just don't want to lose. And so here's King Saul. He's staying under a pomegranate tree. He's probably picking pomegranates. He's probably fanning himself. And he's kind of wishing and kind of hoping that somebody else will step up. Somebody else will kind of come to the forefront. You know, he wasn't the only poor military general uh, in, in history. This is General George McCullen. I don't know if you've heard about General George McCullen, but at the very onset of the Civil War, George McClellan was the absolute commander over all of the armies of the Union. President Lincoln has appointed him to be the uh, general of the uh, Union Army, and his job was to go and defeat the rebellion. And uh, Lincoln was asking him, go attack, and he said, no, I need more soldiers, I need more soldiers. And they got to a point where he waited for nine months Now, the Union soldiers respected him, and they called him the Little Napoleon. But for nine months, he did nothing. And Lincoln was begging him to attack, ordering him to attack, and he wouldn't attack. So finally, Lincoln had to remove him and get him off of the stage. And other generals came on, and other generals came on, and other generals... You know, the reason the Civil War lasted so long and was so bloody? Because the Union had nincompoops for generals. It wasn't until Lincoln grabbed hold of an alcoholic and everyone said, you can't use him, he's an alcoholic. And Lincoln, and Lincoln said of Ulysses S. Grant, but he fights, you know? Forget the fact that he, he fights. That's what we need is somebody who can fight. And things started turning around. And here, King Saul is that kind of leader. He's, 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 he's a moot leader. He's really not leading. He's underneath a pomegranate tree. He's picking pomegranates, but his son Jonathan wants to pick a fight. There's a difference between picking pomegranates and picking fights. And Jonathan has in him a desire to pick a fight. You see, Saul is kind of given into fear. And when you give into fear, you get into a defensive mode. You get into a very cautious mode. You sit on the sideline when Jonathan wants to be on the front line. And there's a big difference. And Jonathan says, I want to go all in. We've been talking about going all in for God. What does it mean to go all in? We talked about it's like pushing all the chips in the middle of the table, saying, I'm going all in. It's burning the ships on the beach. There's no retreat. I'm going forward. And Jonathan says, I'm going all in. This past Friday, I wanted to climb a middle-class mountain to see how my knee would do climbing mountains. And so I climbed uh, uh, Mount Cardigan. And uh, I didn't know. I just looked online. It was a 3,100 footer. And I figured that's not bad. I drive up there. I drive to the AMC hut. I get out and I meet this kid from Rhode Island. He works at the AMC hut. And he goes, welcome to the, most, the second most difficult climb in New Hampshire. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? <laughs> and he says, oh yeah, he says the whole trail, he goes, that's the second most difficult climb. And I says, well, how do I get to the top without going up the whole trail? <laughs> you know, I mean, I was excited, but not crazy. And so, plus, I mean, it was pouring rain and, and you know, it's just, it, it, anyways, 
You go all in by, first of all, taking a first step. Two miles up, two miles down. Put my backpack on. The very first step that gets you in motion, whenever you're going to be all in, sometimes it just takes that very first step. You just got to be committed and say, I'm going to do it, and you just do it. And sometimes we miss a lot of opportunities in life because we want to play it safe. And yet I really feel that the joy in life, the excitement in life, is to take a little bit of risk. To do something that you might balk at at first and to just throw yourself in and just do it. You know, it's interesting. There's a Bible heading that calls this Jonathan's daring plan. I don't know about you, but I think it's the dumbest plan I've ever seen ever. Look at what it says. It says, then Jonathan said, behold, he's talking to his armor bearer now. He says, behold, we're going to cross over to the men and reveal ourselves to them. And if they say, wait until we come down to you, we will stand in our place and not go up to them. He goes on in verse 10. But if they say, come up to us, then we'll go up for the Lord has given them into our hands and this shall be a sign for us. Now, now I don't know about you, but this is like the craziest military tactic I've ever heard in my life. First of all, Jonathan and his armor bearer reveal themselves. They disclose themselves to the enemy. So they give up any kind of surprise. They give up the element of surprise. And then they've already conceded the high ground of the enemy. If you look at this area where Michmash is and, and, these, and these craggy mountains, the, 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 the Israelites, King Saul, 600 men are on one side. There's a, a, a decline, then a little bit of a valley, and then a huge craggy cliff. It's, it's like an insane cliff to climb. And the Philistines are on top of that cliff. And Jonathan, his daring plan is, let's reveal ourselves to them. And if they say, yeah, come on up and fight us, then we'll go up. That's a sign that the Lord's given, us, you know, given them into our... And I'm thinking, no. <laughs> no, I mean, if it was me, I'd say, Lord, give me a sign. When we reveal ourselves to them, let them start falling off the cliff. If they start falling off the cliff on their own, then that's a good sign. That means we'll go and take, you know, I mean, listen, the climb up this cliff was as dangerous as the 10 to 1 odds that they were facing when they got to the top. The climb up this cliff was absolutely going to expend their energy, let alone to get to the top and then have to get into sword fights with these crazy Philistines. And so this is just, you know, when you stop and look at it, you're thinking, what's he thinking? But listen, here it is. When did we ever come to believe that Jesus died to keep us safe? When did we ever get to believe that Jesus died to keep us safe? We have brothers and sisters around this world that are living anything but safe lives. Those 300 girls that were kidnapped by the, the terrorists, they were Christian girls. They were from a Christian school. In Nigeria, where that took place, there's all kinds of conflict where they're burning churches and killing Christians. You don't hear about that on the TV, do you? There is such a rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Christianity in this world today right now. It's absolutely alarming, but nobody's raising a peep about it. You see, and we are, we are one step away from persecution in this country right now. We, you know, we, we just don't get it. You look at some things at the news and you see what the uh, atheist liberal group is doing against Christians, shutting them down. Do you know how many commencement speakers were invited to go speak at colleges? But because they were Christians, they were booed out, they were shouted out, and those doors were closed. And yet they'll bring in some yin-yang from across the world and, and talk about anything that they want to talk about. But boy, if you have traditional values. There were two brothers that were supposed to be on uh, the, the home uh, uh, HGTV and they got booted because some liberal group said it. They have traditional values. They are against anything homosexual or gay. And they got booted from the TV program just, just simply because they believed something. Listen, what happened to tolerance? You can't even believe something nowadays, let alone say anything about what you believe. We are a hair's breadth step away from persecution in this church where they will shut you down because you don't agree with the way political rightness and correctness is going. And so when did we get to believe that Jesus ever died to keep us safe? He didn't. See, there's a big difference between letting things happen and making things happen. 
And Jonathan is like, you know what? I'm going to make things happen. I'm not just going to let this thing play out. I'm going to make something happen. And look what, it, look what it says in verse 6. It says, Then Jonathan said to his young man, who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. For the Lord is not restrained to save by many or a few. I love Jonathan's theology. He's like, listen, we are Israel. We are in covenant with God. God is doing something unique with us in the earth. God can't let us be wiped out because we're his instrument that he's using. Therefore, this battle is the Lord's. And, and if God's going to give us the victory, he can do it just as easily through two of us as he can through 600 of us because he's God. The other day, I was talking to Darlene. Brian and I have been going to the Citizens Police Academy, learning all kinds of stuff. And last week, it was the animal officer. And, and we were talking about all kinds of stuff. They talk about rabies. And, and boy, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize rabies, just, you know, it's fatal. I mean, if you don't get it treated fast enough, it's fatal. And years ago, there were entire communities in New Hampshire that were quarantined because of rabies pandemics. That's why you have to get your dogs uh, uh, registered and, and, and injected against that kind of stuff. And, and I was thinking, oh boy, when rabies gets into the brain, that's it, it's a done deal. And I was like, I wonder if Jesus could heal rabies. And then I stopped and I'm like, uh, he's God. He can do anything he wants to, whenever he wants to, however he wants to. Of course he can heal rabies. What was I thinking? A little lapse of judgment there for a second. Of course he can heal rabies. He can heal anything. And this is what Jonathan's saying. God can do anything. It doesn't matter if there's 6,600 or two. God can save. But I like what he says here. He says, let's go up there. Let's get into a fight. Let's give it to him, perhaps. Now that's a word to cause you to pause. Perhaps the Lord will do something. And then again, perhaps he won't. You know, this is where it gets a little crazy. Jonathan's like, you know what? I'm going all in. I'm pushing the chips in the middle of the table. I'm burning the ships on the bank. I am going all in. It doesn't matter. If we go up there and die, then we die for a good cause. We die for what we believe in. And, and, and this is what it means to be all in. We're committed. We're going all in for the things of God. Listen, this is what Mark Batterson said at a college commencement speech. I love this. He said, quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Set God-sized goals. Pursue God-ordained passions. Go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Keep asking questions. Keep making mistakes. Keep seeking God. Stop pointing out problems and become part of the solution. Stop repeating the past and start creating the future. Stop playing it safe and start taking some risks. Expand your horizons. Don't accumulate wealth. Accumulate experiences. Enjoy the journey. Find every excuse you can to celebrate everything you can. Live like today is the first and last day of your life. Don't let what's wrong with you stop you from worshiping what's right with God. Burn sinful bridges and blaze new trails. Don't let fear dictate your decisions. Take a flying leap of faith. Quit holding out. Quit holding back. Go all in with God and go all out for God. I love that. Go for it. Don't let what's wrong with you stop you from worshiping what's right with God. Stop living as if the goal of life is to arrive safely at death. Go for it. Live life big. Pick a fight and go for the things that God has for you. Go all in. Now listen, a while back, we as a church did Draw the Circle 40-Day Prayer Challenge with Mark Batterson. Everybody got these books. Everybody committed. We said we were going to fast. We were going to give up certain things. We were going to start on a certain day. And for 40 days, we were going to read the devotionals and we were going to pray. And it was going to end on Good Friday, right? I mean, so many people, even the even kids in Kid Zone were getting involved and in giving up things and doing this, the 40-day journey. And, 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 and I was like, oh, this is going to be so good. <laughs> And it started. It started. And for 40 days, and actually, forget the 40 days. It's still continuing today. When I said I've been in the ministry for a long time and I've never seen so many lives implode in a 40-day period of time, I wasn't kidding. I'm talking about sin being revealed. I'm talking about 
lawsuits. I'm talking about deaths. I'm talking about car accidents. I'm talking about things that were going on in people's lives, things breaking down in a weird fashion. Everywhere, fires to put out, phone ringing off the hook. I'm talking about people's lives started going crazy train. And I was like, holy mackerel. I don't think this is the way this is supposed to work. And even to this day, just one thing after another, after another, things are going on in people's lives, people losing jobs, people, I mean, it's just been insane what has been going on. Absolutely crazy. And I sat there and I began to think to myself and I said, you know, this isn't the way this is supposed to work. You know, the enemy is a terrorist. The enemy is a big bully. The enemy tries to throw his weight around to get you to change what you know is right. Let me just say something, folks. We script this thing. He doesn't. We script this. We say what goes on. He doesn't. And so I was just like, you know what? I don't like the way this is going. And so I am going to challenge us as a congregation to go all in with God. And starting June 2nd, we're going to start this all over again. We're going to do 40 days all over again because I don't like the way it's going. And we script this thing. The devil doesn't. We'll do another 40 days. And if you haven't, if you weren't in on the first, we bought another 20 books, 15 or 20 books. I think they were $5 a book. We were giving them at a really good discount. So if you don't have a book and you want to jump in with us June 2nd, that's a Monday away uh, from tomorrow, we're going to start this again for 40 days and pray every day. And we're going to pray something specific. We're going to pray for breakthrough. Every single day, I want you to pray something specific. Breakthrough. That God will break through. Because I started thinking about some things. I started thinking about what the Word of God has to say. The Word of God says that when sin increases, grace abounds all the more. You see, we are living in a very dark time. We're living in probably one of the most difficult times in American history because we've become a post-Christian nation and we have most of the majority of the population of America absolutely biblically illiterate. Biblically illiterate. See, when Billy Graham and other evangelists did the big crusades in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, they were drawing from something that was resident in the lives of people because most Americans had gone to Sunday school of some kind or, you know, whatever as kids. Crusades don't work anymore because there's nothing to draw from. People are biblically illiterate. They don't know what the Word of God says. They don't know anything about the Word. They've they've taught that it's mythology. they taught that it's old-fashioned, that it's archaic. It's not relevant with modern science. It doesn't compute with evolution. It's just just a fallacy. And, And so there's an uphill battle. But you know what? The Bible still says where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. And I believe that when God begins to move with grace, that he paints with a broad brush. I believe that when God begins to move with grace, deep calls out to deep. And God calls forth that which is inherent in a creation, that God-shaped vacuum that's in the heart of every single person starts getting stirred up. And God begins to speak to them and God begins to whisper to them. And I believe that God knows how to call people out of darkness into his marvelous light, regardless of how many Bible knowledge they have or don't have. And so that's what the Word of God says. Where grace, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And then, and then this scripture is so powerful too. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that's formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. This is such a tremendous promise. You know, I like sometimes to just back up and I just look at, oh, let's see what the Lord declares. The Lord declares that he is our vindication. Why? Because we're his servants. You're a servant of God. You've given your life to Jesus Christ. You're his servant. And if you're a servant, you've got a heritage in Christ. You know what that heritage is? That judgment is not going to come against you and that you in turn will judge every tongue that accuses you. Who's the accuser of the brethren? This isn't talking about picking a physical fight with a physical enemy. This is talking about a spiritual thing that takes place because the enemy is busy forming weapons against you. 
The enemy is busy forming weapons against you. But he says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. You know, it's amazing. Years ago, armies used to take their swords, line up in an open field, and then just charge each other and start hacking away. Last man standing wins. And then somebody looked at that and said, you know what, there's got to be a better way. Oh, look it, we've invented the rifle. We can shoot each other rather than slash at each other. But armies still came out in open fields and sat there and shot at each other. And then somebody got a great idea and they said, you know what, if we dug a bunch of trenches and, and hid in those trenches, then, then we wouldn't be out in the open. And so trench warfare began. And somebody looked at the trenches and said, you know, it's got to be a way to breach these, these trenches. And so they invented tanks. Tanks were invented to breach trenches, to go, as a matter of fact, in the early days, the weapons on the tanks weren't in the front, they were on the sides. So they would go into a trench and just strafe the thing up and down the sides. And then somebody's looking at the tanks and they're saying, you know, these things are a real menace. We've got to form some kind of weapon to stop tanks. And so the bazooka and the anti-tank rounds and all this crazy thing. What happens is people would look. People would form strategies. The devil watches you. Hosts of darkness watch you. And they meticulously form plans and weapons against you and against your life. And let me just say something. You are no match for them. Evil spirits don't die and go away. They're always around. They're not destroyed. And so they've been around for 6,000 years of human history. I think they know psychology better than anybody. I think they know human behavior better than anybody. And they look at you and they say, look at that person. I know exactly what to form and what to build and what to throw into their lives to just mess them up. I will eat their lunch and pop their brown paper bag all at the same time. I will mess with them. I will harangue them. I will harass them. I will oppress them. I will just give them bad days. And so the enemy sits there and forms weapons against you. But guess what? The promise of God is no weapon formed against you will prosper. In other words, it won't succeed. Let him make his plans. Let him strategize his strategies. Let him form whatever he's going to form. It won't succeed if you know your heritage is a servant of the Lord. If you know that you're in tight with God. If you're willing to go all in. If you're willing to pick a fight. If you're willing to stand your ground. If you're willing to call out on the grace of God that abounds when sin does abound much more. I love this scripture too, Isaiah 59. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And because I, I was thinking, I'm like, holy smokes, I've never seen like anything like this in, in all the years of ministry, in all my years of pastoring. I've never seen anything like, like what's going on in this church right now. And I thought, well, you know what? When the enemy comes in like a flood. Now listen, something just that you might want to know. There are no commas in the Hebrew language. All right, so let's do something here. When the enemy comes in like a flood, comma, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Let's get rid of that comma there, and let's just put it in over when the enemy comes in, comma. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God's going to raise up a standard. You ever see films of the tsunami that hit Indonesia? Did you see footage of that? Did you see that wall of water filled with debris because it just picked up everything in its wake and it just came crashing in? There was nothing to stop it. There was nothing. Buildings couldn't stop it. Trees couldn't stop it. Cars couldn't. There was nothing that could stop it. And he's saying, listen, when the enemy comes in... God is going to, like a flood, raise up a standard against him. A breach that's just going to bust everything down in its way. That's why. That's why we're going to do 40 days all over again. And, I, and I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm at, no, I'm telling you, I want every single person to participate. Again, you have these books, bust them back out, dust them off. June 2nd, we're beginning again. If you need one of these books, see Darlene, see Diana, go in the office. We've got some books. We want you to have a book. We want you to go through this process because we believe that when the enemy comes in like a flood, 
Or when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. Look at it, it says in 2 Samuel, this is King David, and David has this great victory against the Philistines at Baal Perizim. And David came to Baal Perizim, and David smote them there, and he said, the Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as a breach of waters. Therefore, he named the place Baal Perizim. Baal Perizim means Lord of the breakthroughs. He says, the, he says, God has broken forth on my enemies like, like a flood of water. He says, like, a, like, a, like a, a dam breaking forth, like a breakthrough of waters. And he says, this, this place is going to be called Baal Perizim from now on, the Lord of breakthroughs. See, God is the Lord of breakthroughs. And you need a breakthrough in your life. You need a breakthrough. I mean, I'm listening to people's lives, what's going on. Marriages in disarray, people losing jobs, people having accidents, people walking under clouds, people just, I, just I, I can't even articulate all the stuff that's going on. It's just absolute madness. It's like a three ring circus. But our God is a God of breakthroughs. And so I'm saying, we're going to go back in 40 days and we're going to pray every single day for 40 days, breakthrough God, breakthrough God, breakthrough into marriages, breakthrough into people's health, people are getting bad reports, people are getting uh, notes from the doctors and things from, no, breakthrough Lord, breakthrough. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, I say unto you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Gates are defensive measures. Gates are defensive measures. You see, if gates are defensive and they will not withstand the church of God, that means the church of God needs to be on the offense. Isn't that right? We're never called to take up defensive positions. We're called to be on the offense. We're called to be moving forward in the, th in the things of God, taking, taking ground. But fear overrides faith sometimes. And either fear or faith are going to make our decisions for us. We're either going to make decisions based in fear and just kind of be like Saul and play it safe and play not to lose, but not win either. Or we're going to be like Jonathan. And we're going to say, I don't want to pick pomegranates. I want to pick fights. Because I know that God's on our side. And he's going to cause the victory because he can win through a few or however many. You've just got to do it. You've just got to, you've just got to, you know, we give the devil too much credence. We give the devil too much credence. Years ago, there was a lady that was attending this church. She was living in sin with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was smoking dope and doing all kinds of crazy things. And then the next thing she knows, she starts having strange phenomenons happening in her apartment right here in Raymond, downtown Raymond. She would hear noises. And then she would hear clinking and clanging. And she would get up at night and all her drawers would be open and all the silverware is on the floor. She would hear banging and slapping and pans and she would get up and all the cupboards would be open and pans would be all over on the floor. She would be laying in bed and all of a sudden all the sheets and blankets would be torn right off of her bed. And the hair on her neck would stand up. She was freaking out. One night, she said, Pastor, I could sense something. I could feel something. And all the hair in the back of my neck stood up. And I grabbed my blankets and tucked them up under my chin. And all of a sudden, she goes, I was in a tugging match. But there was nothing there. And then, poof, they just pulled all the blankets right out of my hand and threw them across the floor. But I couldn't see anything. <gasps> Make an R-rated movie out of it. Make a million dollars because the devil's so scary. He's not. The Bible calls him a worm. Listen, when's the last time it's been raining and you've been out walking on a sidewalk and you see those earthworms floundering around, you know, like, and you're like, oh my goodness, look at the size of that earthworm. It's all of three inches long. It's a worm for crying out loud. It's a worm. And the Bible calls the enemy a worm. Smoke and mirrors. He goes about as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He's a little pussycat with all his teeth and claws going. He's just, you know, smoke and mirrors. And, I, and I'm thinking, this lady's freaking out. And I'm not, a lot of people would be like, I ain't going in that apartment. 
You know what I mean? I was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I've been in all kinds of stuff. Make your head spin. You know why? Because God can save through a few just as much as he can through many. And I remember Dave Chapman and I, we walked into that apartment. We anointed it with oil. We said, in the name of Jesus Christ, poltergeist spirits, you have to go. Boom. Didn't hear anything. Didn't see anything. Just walked away. And she called me up weeks later. She said, Pastor, I've never had another experience again. It's gone. Why? Because it's got to go in the name of Jesus. And it's the same way in your life. The enemy comes in and he starts harassing you and he starts busting your chops. And in the name of Jesus, those chains have got to go. Those chains have got to be broken. We need to pick some fights with the enemy. You know, in 1517, Martin Luther picked a fight with the spirit of religion. He says, I'm not going to do all this religious mumbo jumbo and the selling of rights and the selling of this and that, that. He says, we're saved by faith. That's all that matters. He picked a fight. It was a D-Day invasion. It was like, we're taking ground. The Bible talks about Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles. Craig, if you want to come. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 21. You know the story. Three armies, a coalition of armies come against the people of God. Jehoshaphat's the king. He doesn't know what to do. They're outgunned. They're going to go down in smoke. And, and, and a prophet gets in there and says, hey, dude, this, 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 this battle is the Lord's. And then it says here that when they consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. What an incredible, what an incredible thing. Jehoshaphat says, listen, three armies are coming against us. They outnumber us. They outgun us. But the prophet came up and spoke and he said, listen, this, this battle is the Lord's. And so Jehoshaphat takes the worshipers and he says, you know what? I want you to go out and worship. Why? Why? Why did he do that? Because worship directs our focus on the excellencies of a great big God. Where everything in the natural commands our focus to look at things as they are in the natural. If they had sent the army out, the army would have gone out and compared strength against strength, army against army, and they'd have lost that thing. But they sent worshipers out because worshipers were going to get their gaze not on the army. They weren't even looking at the enemy. They were looking at God. And here's the secret. You don't look at the enemy. You look at God. You look at God. The nation of Israel was looking at a giant called Goliath. David came out and he looked at God. Giants are a lot smaller in the presence of God. That's why the Bible says, magnify the Lord. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Because if you look at your circumstances, you're going to get overwhelmed. And when you get overwhelmed, you're going to get confused. And when you get confused, the enemy's going to bring you down. Because you start forgetting who God is. And if you forget who God is, you forget who you are. And if you forget who you are, then he's going to come in and he's going to steal. And he's going to kill. And he's going to destroy. And that's what's going to happen in your life. You know, the enemy wants to bind us with chains. The enemy wants to wrap things in our life. And he wants to bind us with chains that can't be broken. You know, it's just something about chains. They're, they're, they're awfully strong. And, and some of you, you've been in, you've been in your marriage and you've been, you've been trying to get something to change and you've been trying to see something happen you've never seen happen before but you're chained the situation is chained and you're like you're just pulling against that thing and you're not going anywhere and some of you are wrestling against a sin habit and you've been trying to break loose of that thing and you just can't wherever you go you're chained And when you look at the chains, and when you wrestle with the chains, you're just not strong enough to break the chains. 
But when you begin to look up to heaven and when you begin to look at God, and when you begin to raise your hands and worship him, he breaks the chains. God breaks the chains. God is bigger. God is greater. God is the uncontested heavyweight champion of the universe. God wins his battles. He wants to break through in your life. He wants to break through in your family. He wants to break through in your marriage. He wants to break through in this church. He wants to break through in this community. And it's just up to us to begin to look at him. This morning, whatever it is that you, whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you're wrestling with, whatever chain you're struggling against, I want you to come this morning and stand around this altar. I want you to just get out of your chair. I don't care if it's in your family. I don't care if it's in your children. I don't care if it's in your finances. I don't care if it's in your marriage. I don't care if it's in your physical body, that it's a sickness or a disease. I don't care if it's an attitude that you just can't seem to get the victory over. I don't care if it's a sin practice that has ensnared you. Just find a place around this altar to kneel before God. Just go ahead. Find a place to kneel. Lord, we turn our eyes to you this morning. We turn our eyes to you because you are the heavyweight champion of the universe. You are uncontested. You said there is none my equal. There is none beside me. That every God is a false God. That you alone are the living God. And Father, for every single person here today that's struggling, that's wrestling, that's been under an oppressive attack of the enemy, we believe those chains even now as we worship you are being broken. Even as Paul and Silas in that inner dungeon began to sing worship and praises to you, and their fetters fell off and the doors of the prison opened up, that God, prison houses, prison houses are being opened in the name of Jesus. And that, Lord, you are equipping your saints with power in your name. You said, in my name, we would heal the sick. In my name, we would cast out devils. In my name, we'd preach a gospel. In your name, Lord, in your name, broken, chains broken. Father, we come against the attack that's come against this church. And Lord, we believe that you will turn this around, that you are Baal Parism. You are the Lord of breakthroughs. And for this church, for the people of this church, we ask for a breakthrough in the realm of the Spirit. God, that you'd break through in finances, that you'd break through in health, that you'd break through in families, that you'd break through in marriages, that you'd break through in our worship settings, that you'd break through in the anointing of the Spirit in this place, that you'd break through in this community, God. We're sad and tired of hearing that New England is the land of the chosen frozen. We're tired of hearing how New England is the most unpopulated church area in the country. Lord, if sin abounds here, then your word says grace does much more abound. And we put a pull on grace in the name of Jesus. We put our faith as a hook in the grace of God. And we call it down, we pull it down from heaven. God, manifest grace, manifest grace, manifest the love, the person, the presence, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Manifest your glory, manifest your presence. We will manifest your praise, God. You manifest your presence. We will manifest your praise. You manifest your presence. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We receive by faith. We receive right now by faith breakthroughs. Breakthroughs. Breakthroughs breakthroughs. Let the latter rain of your spirit begin to pour out to where dams can no longer withhold or withstand the move of your presence. 